Hello and welcome to episode 111. That is 111, which is a fantastic number. Um, welcome to this week's episode. I'm your host, Sarah, and I'm so excited to be here. It's going to be a great conversation today. I'm leaning into three ways to determine pace and intensity. Now, if you hang on into through the episode until the end, I'm going to talk specifically about the 5K race and how to structure that intensity, how to structure that type of racing, because it is a little bit different. There are some episodes out there. Episode 82 is all about the half marathon. So I talk a lot about pacing and how to set yourself up for success in 13.1 miles. There's also an episode floating out there all about the 10K, right? And the 10K is also another race that's actually pretty difficult to master in terms of effort and not going out too fast. So that's also another great episode to listen to. But I'm really excited about today's episode because whether you're a new athlete and you're just getting into running a lot of the paces, a lot of the intensity is going to feel very, very foreign to you. And you might not realize either if you have paces listed in your workouts that it could mean that you're running on half marathon effort, 10K effort, 5K pace, whatever that is, um, if it's not listed, right? So I'm going to dive into the three different ways that you can determine your pace, your intensity, and how it all kind of works, how it can work together, but most specifically, the one area that really I feel like is the king and queen to really set you up for success as a long-term athlete. Now, we definitely, I definitely have long-term athletes who listen, advanced runners. And I think this conversation is going to be great for them as well, because I think a lot of times, like the more we know our bodies, and I'm kind of speaking from experience here, the more we know our bodies, the more we know what pace we quote unquote should be running. I think the harder it can be to run on effort because we know what we should be running, right? But what we should be running isn't always what we can be running that day, if that makes sense. Like it can kind of uh, vary and alter all depending on the day. So before we get into this conversation, are you showing up to training, feeling a little tired, feeling drained? Are you wondering what your inner age is? Maybe you're curious to know what your nutrients and vitamins are and where you can up level in certain areas so you can show up strong, happy, and confident in training. Because I know when I feel strong and good in training, it's going to be a domino effect in my confidence. Data helps us objectively measure progress and constantly refine and optimize ourselves. So Inside Tracker will elevate you from the inside while this podcast and your training will elevate you from the outside. You can use code SARAHMPRO25 for 25% off your entire order at InsideTracker.com. That's Sarah, S-A-R-A, M. Pro 25. And if you're listening to this on the release day, on leap day, happy leap day, everyone. <laughs> it's Thursday, the 29th. You can save an additional 4% for 29% off your entire order through the day. So that's a, a fun uh, little thing that Inside Tracker is doing. And I know in the past when I've taken those tests, it has so helped me really help define what I'm feeling and then have a really great plan moving forward to kind of change things up and make things feel a little bit easier in training just by altering my vitamins that I'm taking, my supplements, how I'm eating, when I'm eating, all those good things. So um, it's a really, really great product if you haven't tried it already. Um, before we get into this episode too, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge what happened last week um, with Lake and Riley. She was out for a run in the middle of the day on campus where she went to school and she didn't come home. And I think anytime a story like this surface and it becomes like a high media story, it hits home. I think for a lot of people, primarily women, but I think a lot of people. And she did everything right. She had her phone with her. She told her friends where she was running. She was running in 
daylight. She was running on campus with security cameras everywhere. And there was still an opportunity, maybe a very small window of opportunity for someone to take advantage of the situation and to hurt her. And it's devastating to that community. It's devastating to the running community. And I think when these stories populate, know that there's definitely more of these stories. This is happening more and more. We're just not always hearing about it, right? I think we all know that. And it's also just really sad. And it's it causes, I think, a lot of different feelings. And I know um, over the last few days on social media, there's been a lot of outcry that this must stop. And I totally agree. I totally get it. You know, it doesn't feel good to go out for a run and have to think about your surroundings, your route, what time of day you're going, looking and being aware of everything around you. And I know it's not just for runners, right? And this doesn't just impact runners, right? This is a much bigger issue than female runners running in daylight and being hurt, assaulted, kidnapped, killed, murdered, whatever. It's a much deeper problem that extends to schools, to children, going to a Super Bowl parade, being a person of color, right? There's a much bigger issue going on that I think our world, our society, our country really needs to get control of and really handle, handle it quickly and handle it swiftly. And I don't, I think that's wishful thinking, right? Um, but one of the reasons that I got into coaching was to really help people and to have them feel seen, to have them feel heard, to have someone really believe in them. I think specifically with this sport, it can be a very lonely place to be. If you're not running with a running group, if you don't have a coach, or you don't have a coach who sees and hears you, and that's something that you need, right? And I was thinking about it like getting into coaching, believing in the athlete, setting them up for success, lifting them high, being their cheerleader, and how much good that can do for that person and that domino effect that that can have in their community and who they are connected with and who they are connected to. And if we can elevate kindness, having people feel seen, heard, loved, cared for, holding the door open for people, smiling on the street, letting people know that we care, and we all up-leveled, not all of us, right? That's not realistic, but if we can up-level just a little bit, make this world just a little bit better, I have to think that things like what happened to Lakin, to things that happened in um, Kansas City with the Super Bowl parade, what happens in schools all across the country, basically every single day, we just don't care about it anymore, will stop or decrease, right? Stop's probably wishful thinking. So Lakin has a GoFundMe page that was set up for her on behalf of a family friend. Now, these proceeds are going to go not just for her funeral services, but there's also a scholarship that's been set up in her name, which I think is uh, really impactful. And there's also discussion around another way to kind of use these funds to help um, to help violent situations and other causes that can really make an impact. So I'm going to link that GoFundMe page in the description notes. I know that's kind of a heavy thing to talk about as we go into effort running, but 
it is something that I did want to bring up. It is something that I want to talk about. I think anytime there's like current events going on in the running community, I think it's important to at least acknowledge it and talk through it. And maybe it's a conversation. Maybe it's sending me your thoughts, sending me what we can do to become a stronger unit to help people be able to run and not run in fear and not run in that feeling of anxiety and discomfort. I know I have been there. Um, I do get, I think, a better opportunity to be able to run outside in the daylight with a lot of people around, and I'm really grateful for that. But I know not everyone has that. So um, this will be a conversation that we continue to have. Hopefully it is a conversation that is taken seriously. It is something that we see action, we see improvement on. With any change like this, it does take time, um, but small change is really a big change in my mind for something like this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear anything that you want to share around this. And I'd also love to hear your elevated moments. So I'm going to transition into that. And um, I asked on Instagram this week, what's your elevated moment for the week? I did this on Friday. So I did this on my personal Instagram as well as Elevate. And it was really fun to see the responses come through. So Michelle says, this morning's 5 a.m. 5 a.m. run was hands in the air emoji. And um, she also said one of her, one of the, the people that she ran with in his outfit was just like a big highlight. So it must have been pretty fun, pretty wild. And I love that so much. Um, Lisa says staying consistent and having a solid long run today with a busy work week, which is awesome for her. That means she ran a solid long run on a Friday. And Lisa um, works full-time outside of the house. She's a wife. She has two kids. I know she's extremely busy. She's also training for an ultra, so that's really exciting, and I'm really proud of her. And um, lastly, we had Phil, and he says, probably walking up the stairs since I'm elevating up the stairs. <laughs> so Phil's great. Phil's a, a good friend, and he always makes uh, the best out of any situation. So thanks for that, Phil. All right, so we're going to get into this week's episode it's all about three ways to determine your pace and intensity. Now, there's three different ways that we can kind of determine the right pace for you. So we're going to talk about heart rate training. We're going to talk about pace calculations. And we're also going to talk about effort. And before we even like dive into these, I'm just going to say what my favorite one is. And my favorite is effort, running on effort. If you train with me, if, you co if I'm your coach, like you – know this to be true. Now, I write a lot of workouts, a lot of long runs in paces, but I'm a big believer that if the paces aren't there, if there's extreme outside conditions happening, if um, it's a really warm day, if it's a really windy day, then effort is always the best backup. And this episode actually came about last week when I was planning for this week. And what I loved so much about it is that after I decided I was going to talk about this, Colorado decided to be all springy. If you're watching on the video, I'm wearing this like soft yellow um, crew sweater. It's very spring-like. We're definitely in spring weather right now. It's been fantastic. I've been able to run, wear shorts while running over the last few days, which has been incredible. And I haven't been like, you know, I've been going out around my same time, like earlier in the morning, seven, eight o'clock on weekends. So it's been really nice, but we've had extreme wind. And I just had to laugh a little bit to myself about how good the timing is for this episode because we're going to talk about wind too and kind of how to flow through that. But our first topic or our first pillar today is going to be heart rate. All right. So I know there's so much data that we can gather as athletes, right? There's so much data. And I think sometimes there's too much data to be totally like honest about it. I was thinking about that on my run today about how 
I had a lot of athletes. I was thinking about a lot of athletes today on my run, and that typically happens, um, especially on a Monday where I'm very heavy in final surge. I'm feeling a lot of energy from athletes, both good and bad, and usually, or not bad energy, but just, you know, there's a lot of coaching that gets to happen. And, you know, I think about these athletes and like, you know, how I can help them and what I can say and how I can say it differently to have them receive what I'm saying. And because oftentimes the conversations are, you know, over and over and over again, right? But that's part of it. And it just came back to one thing. And that was just run. Just run, right? So today we're going to talk about heart rate. We're going to talk about paces. We're going to talk about effort. And at the end of the day, it's like, just run. I was running a tempo workout last fall. I think it was a 10K tempo. My heart rate strap at the time was slipping. I was holding my hand held. I was so over it. I was over the heart rate strap slipping. I was over having to hold something running like half marathon pace, half marathon effort, maybe a little bit faster. I was over it. And about four miles into it, I just threw the bottle down. I threw the heart rate strap down to the ground. And I told myself to just run, just run for 2.2 miles, just run, feel the pace, embrace the pace and don't overanalyze. Don't like, you know, just be with it. Right. And I think that can be so freeing. It can be so cool when you just like throw out the data, maybe keep the intentionality, but just run, like not overanalyze, not overthink, just do, just be, right? It's a really powerful place to be, but I think I'm learning that like, it's a very difficult place to be at the same time. I don't think a lot of people know how to do that or know how to get there. So, um, so I'm hoping this episode helps. So we're going to get into heart rate. All right. So you can track your heart rate from a few different ways. So if you have a smartwatch, you're going to be tracking your heart rate from your wrist, but that doesn't actually translate. It doesn't actually track. It's not accurate, which is really unfortunate that they even have it as an option because it's not, um, it's not accurate. So it's going to be off, right? It's taking your heartbeat from your wrist rather than your actual heartbeat um, on your chest. So I highly recommend that if you are going to be training by heart rate, that you get a heart rate monitor. Garmin came out with this fabulous new one for women. It's a Garmin clip on and it clips in three spots. It holds people. I bought it last month because my heart rate strap was slipping a lot. It was slipping often. I'll, every, I would say almost every workout or long run, I would be like either I wouldn't wear it or I was throwing it to the ground, like kind of annoyed with it because obviously if it slips past your sports bra, it's going to land like on your waist, right? And like that's annoying. No one wants to be running a tempo workout with that. So I got the new one. I love it. I think it's great. I think the only time it's not going to work is if you wear like a long line bra or a crop top that is the bra where the heart rate monitor doesn't sit exactly where it needs to sit on like your rib cage or your chest and it's going to be falling a little bit lower. Um, but otherwise I love it. I think it's great. It's not as bulky. It's a little bit smaller. The clips work awesome. It's so great. So if you're a female, if that's something that you want to have and want to get, I'll also link that in the description notes, but, um, it's awesome, right? So that's a good one to use. I know Coros has like the arm band heart rate, and I haven't really heard how that is or if that's, you know, if it works well, if it, if there's a little like discrepancy there. Um, but you also want to make sure that you, that the heart rate monitor for anyone listening, whether you're a female and it's clipped onto your sports bra, or you're a, a male or whatever gender you identify with, 
that it sits appropriately on the chest, right? So if it's over your clothes, and this reigns true for also your wrist, um, if it sits over your clothes or your clothes are rubbing on it or your watch is a little loose, your watch is a little tight, the data is going to be really funky and really off. And I think even in the cold, it's going to be a little off. Like my heart rate will like start out high on these like cooler runs. It'll jump up in mile two and then it like settles in and then I'm fine. So I think it's like really not getting too attached to data again and knowing your body and like knowing how things should feel. Right. So if you're wearing a heart rate strap, if you are training by heart rate, you need to determine your max heart rate, right? So this can be done a few different ways. You can get your VO2 max um, taken, and that's like on a treadmill. It's kind of like um, running to failure, which sounds very scary on a treadmill and not something I want to do. <laughs> so there is another way to do it. You can, you can if you are an established runner – you can war have a really good warm up, do your stretches, your drills, your strides, all that good stuff, and then you can run a thirty minute tempo. Thirty minute tempo um, gets to be at effort, right? So we'll talk about what that effort is later. But thirty minute tempo, you take your heart rate in the last twenty minutes of that tempo, and that is going to be your threshold heart rate zone. And then you can calculate all your other zones. So there are five heart rate zones. And each zone has a specific place for you in training. And a lot of those easy recovery runs get to be in zones one and two. A lot of the marathon and maybe tempo get to be in zone three. Sometimes tempo can land in zone four. And then all out sprinting, you might reach your max heart rate or your zone five at like the end of a really tough long run or at the end of a race when you're like kicking it in. You never want to be in zone five or like, as my co coach calls it, she's like redlining. You don't want to be redlining in the middle of a workout or at the beginning of a workout or the beginning of a race or something like that. So that's just a really quick um, rundown on the heart rate zones and what they're for. But Determining your max heart rate needs to be done in order to develop all of your zones to really know where you need to be running. And then every single run needs to fall into that specific zone that you're targeting. And so heart rate training is very specific. It's very, um, you know, ideally you're, you're all in on heart rate training and that's all that you're doing and you're throwing paces out the window and you're the watch screen is just heart rate. You're just watching your heart rate, right? Austin and I had a great episode with Elizabeth Scott from Running, Exp Run Running Explained all about heart rate and heart rate training and heart rate data. Um, and that's episode 57. So that was just about a year ago where we had that conversation with her. She also has a um, trained by heart rate masterclass that I think is probably phenomenal. I think everything that she puts out is very like, it's really good content. So I would check that out. If you're looking to train on heart rate more, I think it can be, my opinion is, I think it can be a slippery slope because you don't always want to train or you don't always want to race on heart rate. And there's a caveat. You can sometimes, you won't want to for other times, right? It's a lot of slow running. Um, so it works for some athletes and it doesn't work for others. So I think it's at the end of the day, like everything, it's going to come down to like what you want to do, what's going to fill your cup and what you feel most comfortable with um, training wise. Now, I mentioned I have a heart rate strap, but I don't train by heart rate. <laughs> I wear the heart rate strap just to make sure that my easy runs stay easy, which, you know, they do. Um, it keeps me honest. It really slows me down, which is what I need. Um, not always. I think my training slows me down in, like, the best way, right? Like, the fatigue is so high, my legs don't really feel 
<laughs> refreshed and snippy and like snappy to be out there like crushing some 845s on my easy day not happening so um the heart I love it it's like kind of a little competition with myself of like all right how low can you get your heart rate today on this recovery run or this easy run right that's where why I wear it and then it's also fun for me to see in workouts just to see where my heart rate goes um in my workouts and not necessarily track workouts because they're just so short with like that standing rest and that standing recovery. I really love to see it on tempos and like over the weekend I had three by two miles started out at like, I don't even know what pace it would be. I think it'd be like what we think my marathon pace is, but I haven't actually been able to execute it and it felt very joggy. It felt very easy. I just felt like I was crawling, which is a great place to be. And my heart rate reflected that. It didn't go above like 145. It stayed in my mid zone too. Um, and that's a great place to be. And then we dumped into, I say dumped into because it was a very fast transition into 10 mile effort for the next four miles. And 10 mile effort at altitude is tough, right? And I was really excited to see like, well, where did your heart rate go? When did it start to get hard? When did it start to like drift? And I love that data for myself. I love to know like, okay, you got, you know, 1.8 out of the two miles before it started to drift. It was also on a hill with headwinds. So that's probably why. And it did feel a lot harder, but oh, you were also pushing harder and the pace looked different. So I love analyzing that. And then I use it as a way to like build myself up. I don't like to tear myself down with any of this, any of the data, even on my watch. You know, there's so many things with our watch. I've been in maintaining zone for like months, if not a full year. I think I found productive like four times over the last year. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'm maintaining, but I'm getting fit. That's fun. And I just kind of laugh it off, right? And I think there has to be a bit of fun, a bit of play, a bit of staying neutral or letting things roll off off your back and make it into a fun thing. Because if we can get so hyper-focused on all the data and everything it could mean and everything bad that happened in a run, that's a really difficult place to be. That's a really heavy place to be. And you're not setting yourself up for success or having that confidence that needs and gets to build in a training cycle. So on race day, you feel good. You feel ready. You feel fit. You have your visualization, all those things, right? So heart rate training can be a really good tool. It can also be a really good tool if you're going to use it only for the positives, and I say that in just the way that I explained, using the data to make it a win. Let's talk about pace calculations. Some runners love running on pace. I am one of them. I am one of them. With the 3 by 2 workout on Saturday, I told myself, you are running in – the low, I have a range that my coach gives me because I don't typically, I don't typically run exact. I can run exact, but not always. And she does it as a way to like lift me high. I'm going to give Sarah a pace range. So if she falls in this pace range, I know as her coach, she's going to feel good about that because she hit the pace range. So let's actually cut back to two weeks ago when I had a 10K tempo on the, on the treadmill and I had pace ranges for like each kind of section of that tempo. And I stayed on the more conservative side and I was like, this was such a great workout. I felt so good. This was a huge win. And my coach was like, yeah, I want to see faster times next, next week. <laughs> I'm like what? But I crushed it. Right. So I love running on pace. So this last week, and I'm like, three by two miles, let's go. We're running on the fast side of each of these intervals, and I'm doing it. And I was nervous. I was a little anxious. I met up with, oh, gosh, I think there were six of us on Saturday. 
And I knew we all kind of had a different variation of some sort of tempo. And I had the longest workout out of everyone, or I think one other person had a pretty long workout too. So I knew I was going to be still running my workout when everyone was like cooling down, which was fine. But I thought, I think there was a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of discomfort around having an outside run, knowing I wanted to run fast and really like knowing that this was going to be like my shot to prove to myself that I can run these paces. There's no snow. There was very little wind. The wind started to pick up near the end and I wasn't on a treadmill in a warm room. Like this was it. If I'm going to prove myself right, this is the workout to do it. And I really wanted to run pace. And it ended up working out where I did, um, which was a great win. And that was a really great feeling. And sometimes pace and running pace can be a really great win for an athlete. It can be very, um, it can create a lot of momentum. It can create a lot of confidence. But it can also be a very slippery slope because if the pace isn't there or if there's a lot of other factors going into play, it can really tear the athlete down. So you can find pace calculations based on maybe if you're, um, I would say before, at the very beginning of a training cycle, you'll want to do this. If you're brand new to running, I think it's jogging building some consistency, finding some, building a really good foundation before uh, doing anything like this. Uh, Running a time trial is great to kind of track your fitness. A lot of athletes, right, get to a point where they have a training cycle, they race, they recover, they have a training cycle, they race, they recover, they have a training cycle, (laughs) right? That's me. (laughs) I think it's a lot of you too. I think a lot of us do that. It's the best way to continue to get stronger and faster as an athlete if you can balance it all. Because I know it's it's a lot. It can be a lot, especially if there's a lot going on in your life. So to find your pace calculations, you can run a time trial or you can take your race effort, right? Um, and that's going, if you plug that um, time into a calculator, Jack Daniels has one, VDOT has a calculator, McMillan's. Um, has a great calculator. Hanson's has one. They're all just slightly different. So I would start, if you're looking to do this for the first time ever, I would use the Jack Daniels calculator because I feel like that's the, the if there's going to be a ranking, that's going to be the best of the best, right? Probably the most accurate pace calculations. And I'm not saying these other calculators aren't accurate, but I feel like the Jack Daniels one is probably going to be closest to what you want to run because all the calculations are just a little bit different and they're a little bit off, right? So you want to plug that time in. And then what's going to happen is it's going to spit out all of your track workout speeds, all of your tempo, your threshold, your marathon, your half marathon, your 10K, your 5K, your one mile not only pace, but overall time. So you can kind of see what you're in shape for, but it's all very, at the same time, loosey-goosey. So what I love about these pace calculations, more so for what you need to be running your easy days at, what you get to be running your recovery days at, what you get to be running um, tempo or what could be tempo or mile repeats or maybe marathon pace. Sometimes, depending on what race or time trial you plugged into that pace calculation, it spits out a lot of projected race times that are garbage. They're garbage. And that's okay. I think it's if you know that, that's okay. I think what's more important is if you're really trying to find a good marathon projection, run a half marathon, right? Don't run a 400-meter time trial and then think that's going to translate to the marathon. It may over years and years and years of training, but not in one training cycle, right? I did an athlete run a half over the weekend. Meg, she's so great. I hope to meet her in person one day. She's so great. She lives in Florida, 
and we were targeting a 140 half. And I don't think I had the conversation with her on what that meant, but I knew what it meant. Because if she could run a 140 half, she, she signed up for Chicago in the fall. She's going to be within striking territory of running her first Boston qualifying marathon, which is exciting, right? If she was competing in a 400 meter or an 800 meter dash in Florida and we hit a specific pace, I wouldn't be as confident to tell her, yes, in seven months, you're going to string whatever that pace was, because I have no idea what that pace would be, into an eight-minute average or maybe a 750 average, right? Because Chicago's long. You're going to be running about 26.6 meg, and we got to account for the buffer, right? So about 750 pace, which she can do. And I can't necessarily compare that, right? But I can with the half. Sometimes a 10K, sometimes a 5K. A lot of times the pace calculators work really great when you're also working with the coach because they work hand in hand. And the coach can use the data to not only look at race projections, but they can also take a look at how you're running, what, where your fitness is, all that stuff. Take it all in right? But if you're an athlete looking to figure out how to run and where to run and you want to have a very specific pace, I'd plug in your last race that you ran or if you've been running, run a time trial and see where that easy pace lands. See where that recovery pace lands. See where marathon tempo could be, where that threshold level is, where that tempo is. And then you can run that way. Pace feels different every day, though. So it's a slippery slope. Today it was very, very windy. And it's been windy in Colorado, right? <laughs> and I went out for my run and I thought, it's a recovery jog. You just got to do whatever you can do, Sarah, to like not put yourself in a hole. Because the last time it was this windy, which it's about 40 I think that it, the wind is like 20 miles per hour with like 40 mile per hour sustained wind or gusts or something. So it's it's like pretty, pretty wild most of the time. Like you just got to run easy and run north and south since the wind seems to be coming from the west. But if, you're, if you live in Colorado, you're laughing at me right now because it always feels like the wind is there's like a headwind three fourths of the time. So I was still kind of getting headwind running south and a little bit west and what felt like a little bit north. <laughs> Anyways, I just jogged. I'm like, just jog. Don't even look at your watch. It doesn't even matter if your objective today is to run as slow as possible, to not put yourself in a bigger hole than the weekend put you in. This is a huge recovery week. This is a huge recovery run. It doesn't matter. And pace ended up being quite a bit slower than any of my other recovery runs, but that's okay because it was very windy outside, right? You get to adjust. Sometimes it can be looked at as if you are an athlete who trains and races quite a bit, you can find your recovery pace, your easy pace, your marathon tempo, your half marathon tempo, your true tempo, which is going to be just a notch faster than half marathon tempo, your 5K effort, your mile effort, based on your races, right? So that's the other way to do it. My easy pace right now is around 920, and I'm using myself as an example. So this is... I would say most days it's around 920, but I run up and then run down. So it's kind of wild. I wish I had like better data to give you. So like the up is like 950, 945, 950. And then the down is like 850 to nine um, because I'm usually gaining about a hundred feet per mile and I like to keep my heart rate low. Right. So my pace, let's just say 920. Right. And my half marathon pace is a 640. So that's two minutes and 40 seconds difference between my easy pace on a good day. I would say that's a good day. 
My pace today was 950. So good day, two minutes and 40 seconds slower, right? So you want to have that discrepancy, that gap. My recovery pace can fall between 940 and 950. That's a full three minutes slower than my half marathon pace. So the, the way to look at this is marathon pace is usually a minute and a half to two minutes faster than easy. Half marathon pace is typically around two to two and a half minutes faster. 10K pace can be two and a half minutes to 2.45-ish, I would say, faster than easy. And then 5K pace is a full three plus minutes faster, right? My 5K average right now is 6.15. So that's a little over three minutes faster than my easy day. And then my recovery pace is slower than easy. And that's great. Those are the days where your body is meant to recover. It's meant to actually recover while you run. So the slower you go, the better, the better you're recovering. And it's awesome. So pace calculations can work. I know a lot of us love to run on pace, whether it's easy, whether it's um, a workout, whether you have a tempo. We really love those paces. And that's great. It's great when it works, right? And this weekend with the wind, I had a lot of athletes freaking out about paces because it was so windy. There was no way anyone could hold pace in the wind. It was just way too, way too windy, way too strong. So there had to be a lot of adjusting. And this is where effort comes in. So effort is the king and queen of, of training in my mind, even though I don't like to run on effort as an athlete. Isn't that funny? I don't like to run on effort, but um, I really do love the benefits that effort running gives because ultimately when we show up to our race, the race should be run on effort. And I know if you train on paces, that could be really difficult because you have like certain paces in your mind that you want to hit. But I think sometimes that can provide an athlete a huge disservice because you could be more fit than what you were going into. So like the Chicago 5K last year where I averaged 6.15, I, sh I should have just like ran on effort, but I was like so like needing to like – see what that first mile was to make sure I didn't go out too fast. And let me tell you, I did not go out too fast. <laughs> that baby came in very slow. And, I, and it didn't do me any good to like think I was running a certain pace when I could have been running a lot faster because I had more gas in the tank at the end of that race, right? So if you know how pace should feel, if you know how it – can feel during an easy run, a recovery run, marathon tempo, tempo, half marathon effort, 5K effort, it's always going to win. It's always going to win. Chances are, if you had a great training cycle, if you tapered and you race and you run on effort, you're probably going to outrun the pace recommendation from your coach or you're going to be spot on, right? There are times where I've had athletes say, oh, but coach, I programmed the paces that you gave me into my watch, and I just stuck to that during race. It's like, that's fine, because I think there's a lot of ways that that athlete can learn from that, right? Probably really strong progression. They probably felt really good. But at the end of the day, they're not truly racing if you do that, right? Sometimes it's great to just throw the watch away. I kind of had to do that at Indy. I didn't actually throw it away. Now, Sarah Hall did throw her watch away at the trials at mile 17. Did you know that? She took it off, threw it out. Someone has it. <laughs> I don't know if she threw it to someone that she knew or if she's sponsored by Koros or Garmin. I'm not really sure what the situation is, but she threw her watch off, and I love that. She went, she went for it. She didn't want Pace to be her... Achilles heel. 
how many of us have looked down at a pace and has started to like freak out internally because it was too fast? And I'm saying too fast in air quotes, too fast. But maybe that's exactly where we needed to be. I'm really glad my watch didn't work at Chicago because my last two miles came in at like what we think is like very low sixes, like 602, 603. I think I would have freaked out if I saw that because I know what that pace feels like in Colorado. And that's, I usually like start breathing really heavy, like, I don't know, eight, nine minutes into like a two mile effort at that. But in Chicago, I felt fantastic. I felt great. I was flying. But if I think I knew I was running that fast, I would have held back. I would have pulled back, right? That's where the pace and looking at your watch and really like getting in our heads can set us back as athletes. Something I suggest for athletes getting either into the sport or if they do like get in their heads when they start to see pace that's faster than they have run before is to cover their watch and not look at it or flip their watch over, right? It can be on the the opposite side of your wrist. You can cover it with tape. You could cover it with a long sleeve. You could change the watch face and just have it on like the time or the heart rate or something like that, right? It's so interesting how our mind can take over, right? But effort, effort's always going to win. Last summer, I uh, trained a summer of speed. I did a lot of track work. I did, I so I had track workouts on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And then I had my long run on Sunday. And if you're a longtime listener, you know that I was, I crumble. I fall apart in the summer from the heat. I am a very warm bodied person. I'm a warm bodied athlete. I, once I get hot, my body just cannot regulate and it just feels like my skin is on fire. This is typically like on workout days when I'm 8 a.m. in the summer, which is when my team trains. Like it just feels like my skin can't breathe. I can't breathe. It's a really, really uncomfortable feeling. And pace is impacted. And I, don't run the paces that are listed. It's basically on effort. And I think now that we're like two summers through this together, my coach and I like hopefully <laughs> she doesn't question it again this summer, but it's just how I am. And there are ways to kind of like be stronger in that area, but I don't think I have the resources or the capability to do it at the time. And that's okay because I ran on effort. The effort was still there. The paces were slow. So for three months, every single Wednesday and every single Saturday with my team, I was like the last one, which is fine. But that's not typically the case, so that doesn't feel good, right? But I'm like, it's fine. This is just how it is in the summer. I just have to keep showing up. I have to keep doing it. Really run the effort I know this is supposed to be, and it will pay off. And I tell you, the first day it cooled down, I felt this huge up level in my fitness, huge. I was unstoppable. If you followed me last fall, I had my best training cycle ever. I had two huge PRs in the 5K and the half. And I absolutely fell apart at CIM when it was warm and humid. (laughs) Happens, right? If you run on effort and can let go of the expectation of the pace on your watch or what it should say, you're going to be a winner. You're going to be a winner anyways. I don't want to like discount anyone. You're going to be a winner. Everyone's a winner. And you're going to find a lot of growth as an athlete. You're going to find a lot of fitness. You're going to find a lot of good within that training. And it's going to build on confidence. So whether you're running in the summer and you're transitioning to fall or maybe you're down on yourself right now and you just feel like the paces feel really hard all the time and you're really trying to like flow through that, if you hang on, at some point it will flip. And then get ready because it's going to be a great ride. It's going to be a great season of running, a great season, a strong season. You're going to find a lot of mental toughness. You're going to find new tools on how to flow through that, which is really incredible. 
So the RPE scale, rate of perceived exertion, is an incredible tool for anyone looking to run on effort, right? I love using it with some athletes, and I especially love it for all summer training. It's so, so tough to give a pace knowing like there are way more factors in the summer or like let's say wind right now in Colorado or maybe you just, you live in the Midwest, you got a huge snowstorm over the weekend, right? Effort is going to be there. Snow is going to make everything feel harder. Wind is going to make pace feel harder. Heat is going to make it feel harder. Extreme cold. So maybe it didn't snow, but you have extreme cold. Oh, I remember having to run, getting to run. It was right after the Houston half last year. Oh my gosh. It was so cold that morning. It was the Wednesday after the race. And because the race didn't go well, because it was, it was uh, warm and humid. Shocker. <laughs> I had a workout. It was awful. I think it was maybe 10 degrees. So your body can't actually produce the same pace when it's in extreme temperatures. Like summer or winter. Um, so effort's great because eventually you're going to get back there and, and give it your all. So if you are consistently tracking your RPE, um, which is like feeling your heart, feeling your breathing, understanding and feeling the pace, understanding your sweat levels, understanding kind of how you should feel, it's going to help you on race day because you're going to be able to run a better race, much better race than sticking to a pace we're sticking to a heart rate. At the end of my half at Indy, I went for it. It was not in the notes. I actually didn't have notes for that race. <laughs> I had a first, I had my first mile, 650 to seven. And then her notes were race smart. I don't know if I've ever shared that. I think I did with some people like individually, but so I went for it. I was like, I just got, I have got to go. I have more energy. I don't care what's happening right now. Like I just need to go. So at mile nine was really the point where I asked myself, like, what can you do in the next 28 minutes? You have four miles left, you know, 4.1. The tangents are a little bit long. So it's like 4.25. <laughs> what can you do in 28 minutes of work? Go do that. The rest, the first nine miles didn't happen focus on the next 28. And what happened was I just focused on one mile at a time, holding pace. And then I was like, all right, it's time to go. You held for like two miles. It's time to push and just see what happens. And it was probably one of my only races where my feedback to now was that I, I gave it everything I had. I said that last mile was everything I had and I don't think I could have ran another mile at that pace. Like that was like it. So I averaged 640 for the race, 639. That last mile came in at 624. My kick was at six, but I was like hurting. <laughs> and that cool down hurt more <laughs> in a totally different way, right? But if you can feel the pace and understand your body, which is where the effort running comes in, you are going to be your best secret weapon on race day, which is so cool. So the RPE scale is a huge piece to all of this. And I get so many questions on the RPE scale, like what does this supposed to feel like and what should this feel like? And there's a range there's a lot of RPE skills out there. I think a lot of people, um, they're just a little bit different. So you need to lean on to one that you really believe in, one that you can feel. This is the one that I feel like is most effective for endurance athletes. It's on a scale of one to 10. One is gonna be walking. Two is gonna be run walking. Three, is your recovery run. Now I'm also going to put this in context for pace so you can understand, or there's like a, another level of understanding of what this is, but know that it's also supposed to be on effort. Recovery run, 10 to 20 seconds slower than your easy run. Four, your easy run, your jog, 
you can sing and talk without hearing yourself breathe. <laughs> Great day. You can sing the era's um, playlist. No one even knows that you're running, right? I talked to an athlete after she finished the Houston half this year. I was running on the treadmill, and she had just finished her race. We were talking about a race, and she had no idea I was running on the treadmill until I told her I was like, oh, yeah, I'm running. I don't even know how it came up. Maybe she's like, I got to go. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to finish my run. <laughs> she didn't know I was running. That's what, that's what you want <laughs> with an easy day. Five is going to be marathon effort. Five to six, marathon effort, depending on where you are in the marathon. You can chat. Breathing is starting to get noticeable. So it could be one to one and a half, maybe, I'm sorry, one and a half to two minutes faster than your easy effort. It's wild now when I do race marathons, how much talking goes on and how much talking I do. <laughs> At Chicago, I was like talking up a storm with people for the first half. And I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> like, I've heard people talk about this. I'm finally doing it. It's so cool. That's how it should feel, especially in the first half. If you can't talk in the first half, it's going to be a long day. Six. Half marathon effort. Six to seven could be half marathon effort, depending on where you are in the race. You can speak a few words with, with noticeable breathing, but you cannot speak full sentences. This could be two to two and a half minutes faster than your easy effort. Seven, 10K effort. What can you hold for 6.2 miles strong and fast? So this could be related to like, a lot of people say 10K efforts like tempo. So what can you run and hold for an hour? Which probably for beginner athletes sounds daunting. Like I can hold easy effort for an hour, thanks. And that's true, right? But you could look at it like breathing is, is labored. It's noticeable. It's harder to talk. I know when I run tempo, at least at altitude, I'm not talking. I'm not singing. I'm focusing on my breath and how the pace feels and how to like channel that feeling on race day. Because how I feel in training at altitude, I want that same feeling at lower elevation, but the pace is going to be faster. Could be two and a half minutes faster than your easy pace. Number eight, 5K effort. This is going to be where breathing is labored early. You have uh, three plus minutes faster than your easy pace. So 5k effort is strong. It's fast. Um, it's going to be something ideally that you're, you know, that you could hold for a 5k, but again, there's different points in training. So that's going to feel a little bit different. So the effort's going to change over the course of the training cycle. Number nine is the one mile effort. So how long can you go for four laps around a track? 1600 meter effort, I should say. <laughs> and then number 10, short sprint effort. So like a really fast 100 or 200, right? You want it to be full out, number 10. So that's the RPE scale. I may or may not post an Instagram post on this on Thursday to align with the episode. We'll see how the week goes. Um, we'll see how the week goes. But I love that scale. And if you're still kind of like scratching your head, know that that's normal. Know that effort is tough to run. The longer you run, the better you get not only at your running form, but feeling pace and understanding effort. My first tempo back to, um, back to training after CIM was, I think it was right around New Year's and there was no paces my coach just had six out of 10 and I even had to take a step back and think like, well, what would that be? Right. But, in, but I'm thinking about pace, right. And when there is an effort listed, it's not about pace. It's about feeling. How do you feel at six out of 10? Do that. And you can't lose. Like, if I were to say to her, all right, I ran seven-minute mile pace, six out of ten. Actually, no, let's not do that because that is six out of ten for me. Let's say I ran, let's say I ran seven thirties. 
And I'm like, yep, that was six out of 10 for me today. The coach can't argue with that. Not like a coach argues, but like they can't push back on that, right? Like that's you being you on that specific day. And there's going to be so many factors that impact pace, that impact effort, right? The snow, the cold, the wind, the summer. Let's talk about your nutrition, your gels. If you're transitioning from winter to summer, like Colorado also had this weekend, and that sun was intense. I finished my long run on Sunday. I was in shorts and a long sleeve, and I wanted a tank top on. It was hot. It was warm. It felt incredible. I think it got to almost 70 on Sunday, which was great. Not for global warming, but just for the soul. It was good. Right? So there's going to be so many different factors that come into play that I think any time that we go into a workout, we go into a training cycle, we go into um, a long run, a training run, there's going to be so many different things that impact it. And if it doesn't work out the way that you want it to, I want you to take a step back. I saw a lot of athletes freaking out over the weekend, and that hurts my heart because that's a lot of anxiety. That's a lot of feelings that are warranted to some extent but don't need to be there, right? Take a step back and think about what was in my control and what did I do? Did I set myself up for success? If I can say I did everything, I slept well, I had great nutrition, I had great hydration, I picked a good time of the day to run. I picked a good route. My mental strength was there, and the pace still wasn't there, so I ran on effort. It's a win. There's no need to be anxious or depressed or upset. That's a huge win. The pace will come. I'd rather see pace on race day than a pace in training, you know? I had this really long tempo right after... I think it was right after Chicago last two years ago. So I ran the Chicago Marathon in 22, and then I ran a 10K in Houston five weeks later. It worked out fine, but, you know, that's playing with fire a little bit. And then I think shortly after that, I had a seven-mile tempo or something, which is ironic because I have a seven-mile tempo this weekend. (laughs) I'm not going to channel this energy. But it went terribly. And I had to, like, within not even the first mile, I was like, oh, you're running this thing on effort today. There's no way you're hitting these paces. It just wasn't there. And I, as an athlete, can really feel like, okay, I'm going to warm up into this. Or, whoa, this is the, this is something on my side that I didn't do well. That's I'm not hitting this pace today. <laughs> right? I love feeling the pace. That was one of the reasons I was a little bit nervous, but also very excited about my workout on Saturday, three by two miles. I wanted to feel 6.30 pace on the road. No other factors, no snow, very little wind, no treadmill. I wanted to feel it so I could be it and run it. So it helps me in my race in April. If you can feel pace, if you can feel effort, if you can practice this, and it can be practicing in a lot of different ways, it takes a lot of time to understand effort. And sometimes you understand it, and then you have to relearn it again like I did this year. What is 6 out of 10? But if you can practice it and practice going into a workout, going into a track workout, and instead of being glued to the watch and seeing what pace comes through, really feeling it, feeling the pace, feeling your steps, feeling your breath, I think that's very important. It's one of the reasons why my coach doesn't like us listening to music when we run tempos. She wants us to feel and hear ourselves. Like, Be with your body. Don't be distracted with music. But I love music, so I listen to music when she's not there, (laughs) which is most weekends. 
It's every weekend, actually, which is fine. Um, and sometimes I race with music. I think I'm at a point, too, where I know how I feel. I know how my breathing is, right? The breathing is huge. How your pace feels, how your legs feel, how your body feels, how your mind feels, right? If you can vary effort in all of your training rounds, that's going to be a really great way to help too because then you're going to start to feel the difference every single day. Today was an awesome recovery run. 950, some in headwind, some in tailwind. I was just out there. I was like, this is a this is a jog. This feels great. And then I have tempo that's quite a bit faster. It's like feeling into it, right? Your easy run's going to feel a little bit different. Your track workout's going to feel a little bit different. If you're intentional with the pace, if you're intentional with feeling and being with the workout, being with the run, you're going to get more out of it than trying to hit a pace and not realizing what pace you're running, why you're running it, and just going all out. So varying effort is going to be a great way to understand it, really being in tune with your body, being in tune with effort, trying it out. You have nothing to lose, right? It'd be kind of cool, too, to run a workout on effort and then just see at the end of the workout how close you were to hitting the paces prescribed. That's a great way to know how close you actually are if all things are equal, like you feel good, the weather's good, you're on the track, like all those things, right? So in episode 109, there's a Q&A part two um, where I talk about the dial, like pace dials. I talked a little bit about that today. But each training run should have a slightly different pace dial. All right. So lastly, how to race a 5K. I get this question a lot. I have athletes racing a five, I have athletes racing 5Ks this, this spring. So I love this question because at first, um, there's one athlete that keeps asking me, like, how to race a 5K. Cause she goes out too fast, and then she falls apart. And <laughs> that is one way to race a 5K. <laughs> it is. And, you know, I really had to think about that because – Racing a 5K is different, especially as endurance athletes. It's very different than racing a marathon. It's very different. So the way I like to think about it is if you're going out to race a 5K, like you have some idea of what your 5K race pace should be, right? I think it's important to take that first half mile to warm up into the pace. So this particular athlete, she goes – beyond 5k effort for the first half mile and then maybe it's not the full half mile but she does start out way too fast and living at altitude you go anaerobic and you're done you can't you can't run anything you're basically jogging for the rest of it in her case she's like trying to catch up right you go out way too hard and then you slow down and then you're still running 5K effort, but that feels extremely hard because you went out too fast, right? So I really like to think of it as taking the first half mile as like 10K effort and warming up into the pace. Now, this is going to be for athletes who don't know how to race a 5K or haven't raced a 5K. And then you can drop down to 5K effort after that first half mile, or, or maybe it's like the first 1K, right? They probably have Ks listed on the course. So I think that's really a good way to do it. And then you'll want to run hard through mile two and then just do what you can do to hold for mile three. Most athletes are going to give up a few seconds in the third mile. Um, so the quote unquote right way <laughs> to race a 5k is going out hard, maybe taking a few seconds off mile two, but then you kind of Usually they're hold or you give back a few seconds on mile three because it's just so hard, right? 5Ks are tough. It's a totally different pain and intensity than a marathon. It's different. So you have to be aware of that first and foremost. 
you can practice it in training. You can practice it on the track. You can practice running pace. You can practice and feeling F 10K effort on the track. You can practice um, feeling 5K effort on the track. I love the track to feel pace. It can be a little wonky if you're used to running really fast on the track and then you're doing these like intervals that are a bit slower. It can feel a little weird. I think practicing in 5Ks is a great way to do it. And what's awesome about 5Ks is that you can recover really quickly from them. So you could theoretically race a 5K every weekend if you wanted to. Um, taking a step back afterwards to assess what worked, what didn't work, how to set yourself up for success on the things that didn't work. Maybe it's the mindset of when it gets hard. Maybe it's making sure you don't go out too fast, right? Um, so with the athlete in particular that I mentioned, she goes out way too fast and then we're like settling into 5k pace, but then another mile later, it's like, she's feeling it, right? We are practicing 5k effort on the track and running 400 meter intervals at 5k effort, having to really feel that pace, feel it, understand what it should feel like. So when she starts her next 5k race, She's there and she's not going over. So it's more like programming the pace a bit. It's an entire skill set to learn. It's wild. The 5K is like, if you want a goal for the year and you're like, oh, I'm kind of bored with marathons. I'm kind of bored with half marathons. I don't want to run an ultra. Learn to race a 5K. It's going to keep you on your toes. There's a lot to learn. And that training plan can be intense. It can be really hard, really tough. But gosh, you learn so much about yourself. You learn so much about the sport. You learn how to race, and you are ultimately going to get faster to be able to crush those longer distances if you decide to go back. So that's this week's episode. I hope you gained something from this. I hope this was a good conversation for you. I know effort running can be a little in that gray area of it. it it's not a lot of objectiveness. There is a lot of subjectiveness and that comes from you as an athlete and learning your body, learning yourself, learning what you're capable of. So I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'd love to answer them and I hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening.